Would you please open your Bibles with me to Esther chapter 3? I said recently that I wanted to follow up our series in Esther with some sermons that build on uh, themes or truths or, how to put it, circumstances that we find in this book that relate to us in our day and our age. And so, to be clear, sometimes a sermon will take a passage and use it as a launching pad to say this introduces a larger discussion, which is not necessarily rooted in Esther itself, but is launched by a verse in Esther, and that's what we're doing this morning. Esther chapter 3, in particular verse 8. Esther chapter 3, verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Now, having studied the book of Esther, we know that this verse introduces, in many ways, the central conflict of the book. This is Haman's plan to eradicate the Jews. King Ahasuerus agrees, okay, if there's a, a pesky people in my empire and you're willing to pay, Haman, you're willing to pay for them to be exterminated, sure, if it's not to my advantage to tolerate them, if they don't keep my laws, go ahead and destroy the Jews. When we studied that chapter, I pointed out that we as Christians need to be prepared to face similar situations. And that's what we're coming back to in this sermon and in the next sermon. Because we are exiles dispersed through an empire. Each of us uh, in our birth according to the flesh is from a particular place and a particular culture and sometimes from a larger culture. I may have been born in New England, but I often connect myself very much to Ireland or to other places like that, and I speak of those as my heritage or my culture or even my fatherland or, or, or things like that. But the truth is, according to who I am in Jesus Christ, I don't have a home here. New England is not my home. Ireland is not my home. Because if I live like a Christian... New England will say, you're not welcome here. If I live like a Christian, Ireland will say, you're not welcome here. And so also the nations of the world, in a sense, are an empire. An empire with Satan as its king who hate Christians and who hate God and who hate God's law. And so if we live according to God's law, it will be true of us at different times, more or less, and in different circumstances, more or less, it will be true of us that people will say of us, they have their own laws. They live in their own way. They don't live like we do. They don't keep the king's laws, and therefore, it is not to our profit or advantage to tolerate them. And so I want to think about we in our culture and in our context, if we live faithfully unto God, what are some ways in which we will run contrary? Ways in which we will, we will uh, clash with our culture and even our government around us. If you watch the news, if you read articles, if you're active on social media, then you'll know that there are many issues being debated today, which of course it's nothing new that issues would be debated. There's always something to argue about, but... Issues are seeming to become more polarized, less civilized, and perhaps at times more perplexing. And as Christians, we want to know how to navigate these issues. What is the right opinion or the biblical opinion? How should we think about this? What does God's word say about this? And so this sermon and the next will highlight certain specific issues uh, that Put us in conflict with our culture. Issues where a biblical stance is opposed to the laws and customs of the empire in which we are exiles and strangers. And in this sermon, my, my focus or my angle is especially assaults on the family. Assaults on 
the family. But we're going to start out with three points for establishing a foundation, and then we're going to move on to two particular assaults on the family. I had prepared three assaults on the family, but in the Spanish ministry, we only made it through the first two, and I keep those sermons equal, so that means in English we can only go that far also. So let's start out with three fundamental, um, just three fundamentals. Number one, knowledge precedes discernment. Knowledge precedes discernment. If you find it difficult to wade your way through the, the mess and morass of contemporary issues, then you will be helped when you are reminded that knowledge precedes discernment. In order to discern between two things, between right or wrong, you need to have sufficient knowledge to be able to identify what is right and what is wrong. Knowledge is a prerequisite, a necessary prerequisite for discernment. If you show me two diamonds, and one of them is fake and one of them is real, I probably won't be able to identify or spot the fake versus the real because to my eyes, untrained, without knowledge, they look equal to me. They look just as good, the one as the other. Knowledge must precede discernment. Well, Paul teaches us this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, a very well-known verse. I'll read it to you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul tells Christians, do not be conformed to this world. But Paul, how can I avoid being conformed to this world? But rather, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What you know, the way you think needs to be transformed. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says the way not to be conformed to this world is to have a mind that is trained to know what God has declared to be good, what God has declared to be accept acceptable, and what God has declared to be perfect. In other words, we must know the will of God. We must have knowledge of the will of God, knowledge which then gives us discernment to avoid being conformed to this world. If you are armed with knowledge of the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect, then when the world offers you something that is not good or is not acceptable or is not perfect, you can discern it. And you can say that is not according to the will of God. Knowledge necessarily precedes discernment. But one of the problems that we face when we consider issues of our day or issues in general is that we often start with the problem and then try to work backwards to the solution. We start by almost granting all the ground of the problem and then trying to work ourselves out of this difficult maze of, of falsehood, maybe perhaps intertwined with some truth. And so what I, want you to, what I want to encourage you to do is don't start with the problem and work towards a solution. Have a sufficient knowledge of the truth. Have a sufficient knowledge of what God has said and what God has commanded. Start there with knowledge. And then you will be able to perceive and discern in various issues what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. As opposed to starting in the problem with all of its difficulty and complexity and then working towards clarity, start with the clarity, start with the light, which precedes discernment, and you will be able to more clearly spot errors and backwards thinking in the assertions and beliefs of this world. Many Christians struggle to think clearly about contemporary issues because they lack knowledge of basic truths. And that's not intended to be an insult of people. It's just a general truth that each person has strengths and weaknesses and knowledge. And so as we encounter various ideas in the world, we are more or less equipped to face them. And the more we increase our knowledge, assuming that we have true knowledge based on God's word and God's truth, the better prepared we will be to exercise discernment in the world. Secondly, the second fundamental is that definition precedes discernment. Definition precedes discernment. We know that knowledge precedes discernment. You must know the will of God in order to discern what is not and therefore not be conformed to the world. But also definition precedes discernment. 
as you engage with people, or even for your own sake, this applies just as much to every individual, as you engage ideas and opinions and arguments, it is necessary to insist that terms must be defined. Terms must be defined. One of the biggest causes of confusion and miscommunication in discussions is a lack of definition. So you, you need to ask questions like, when you say X, what do you mean? What do you mean by that term? Can you define that for me? And you need to be prepared to define the things that you are saying also. By insisting on definition, we add clarity. We get a clearer perspective of what we are actually considering, debating, or discussing. So if you have two diamonds in front of you, and you ask the person, would you please label these? If they label one diamond and the other cubic zirconium, then you know clearly it's been defined for you. You're not dealing with, with fakes anymore because you have asked for definition, and now you clearly have it. Definition precedes discernment. You must have knowledge sufficient to define your terms, and then you must insist that others define their terms so that biblical light can be shined on the situation. Okay, so this is what we're actually talking about. You were calling it this, but this is the reality of what we are discussing. You see, now you're no longer debating terms, you're debating actual substantial arguments. And the, the, in order to apply God's word to situations, we have to get past many of the titles and get down to the substantive, the actual issues involved. Knowledge and definition help us to exercise discernment. Thirdly and lastly, the third fundamental, number three, fear God, not man. You must be committed to this point. Fear God, do not fear man. Paul in Romans 12, 2, which we've been using to develop this point, makes it clear that our discernment has, has a pole that we are we're testing. It has a rule. Are we close to it or are we far from it? What is, that, what is that magnetic pole that we are drawn to? What is that rule that we are measuring things by? Paul says it's the will of God. What God has declared to be good, what God has declared to be acceptable, what God has declared to be perfect, what is God's will, this is the all-controlling thing in our lives. This is the all-controlling standard in our lives. We fear, that is, we revere, we honor, we give utmost respect, the highest reverence unto God and his authority over us. And so therefore, what he has declared and his will is supreme. God defines what is good. God defines what is acceptable. God defines what is perfect because he is the creator and this is his creation and we are his creatures. Now, Paul in Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. Fear God and, and conform yourself to his will. What does he say at the beginning of Romans chapter 1 which Pastor Garrett preached on recently. He says that creation is in rebellion to this. Creation is in rebellion against its creator, and creation twists the truth. What God calls good and acceptable and perfect, creatures call evil, unacceptable, and imperfect. And so that's really what this sermon is about, looking at our culture, seeing ways in which it is twisted in rebellion against God, ways in which we must remain faithful unto our God, creator, and redeemer. Like Haman said, there is a people who do not live by the laws of this world. They live by other worldly laws, and it is not to our profit to tolerate them. Paul writes to Christians in that situation, and he says, know what is good, know what is acceptable, know what is perfect according to God and his will. Fear him, not man. If man says, that's bad, and God says, that's good. And if man says, that's unacceptable, and God says, that's acceptable, we must not cave. We must not give in. Yes, but what if people post a screenshot of me on Facebook? Or what if they 
re quote tweeted me on Twitter and said things about me that were mean. That's the world we live in now. We must be willing to be so different to the empire around us that they choose not to tolerate us. Social pressure and cancel culture cannot bully us into fear or disobedience. But I also want to, to qualify this, not qualify fear God, not man, but qualify the way in which the world, the world perceives us. Remember that Jesus and the New Testament writers insist that our reputations should be spotless. Meaning that Christians should be known, we should be known for our humility and our charity and our morality, the way in which we live our lives. The world should have nothing to say against us in terms of real accusations. That we fear God and obey him should be evident to the world. But if that's the case, then we will be known for fearing God and obeying him. We will be known for holiness. And if holiness is unacceptable to the world, as it oftentimes is, then so be it. But let us not be known for being obnoxious, aggressive, quarrelsome, and contentious. There was a man in La Mirada, I don't know what happened to him, but he used to walk around the, this intersection with a megaphone and signs and flags, and he would yell at people all day long. He was not street preaching. He was not proclaiming a message with a speaker. That's not what he was doing. He would yell at people in the name of Christianity. And if people tried to engage with him, he would just yell at them more. And when they walked away, he would follow them and yell at them. Now, that's the worst example. And so you can give yourself a pass and say, well, at least I'm not like that. But through things like Facebook or Twitter or other social media outlets, Sometimes we do yell and become aggressive, contentious, and quarrelsome. That should not be our reputation. Our reputation should be for holiness and a humble resolve to fear God and not man, but not a pugnacious, aggressive, obnoxious, quarrelsome spirit. Fear God, not man. Many people go too far in the name of fearing God, and they become as I have already used this word twice, they become obnoxious, which is not the, the reputation, it is not the testimony that we ought to have to the world around us. So then, in terms of three fundamentals, we ought to know the truth because it precedes discernment. We ought to define our terms and insist that others define their terms so that discernment can do its work. And ultimately, we must fear God and not man. If we fear God, define our terms, and know the truth, our discernment will be greatly improved so that we know what is the difference or where are the conflicts between God's law and the laws of this empire in which we are exiles and strangers. Now let's move on to two assaults on the family where the laws of this land and the way in which we ought to live our lives are fundamentally at odds. No doubt we could list more, but these are two which we will cover in this sermon and move on to more in the next sermon, Lord willing. The first of those is abortion. Remember that knowledge precedes discernment. Know the truth so you can spot the error. So we're not going to start with the problem and work back to the solution. We're going to start with the truth and the light so that we can spot the errors when they arise. Now, God has made a law for all creation, all men, all women, everywhere, at all times, in all places. And he gave this law to mankind in what's called the Noahic covenant. God made a covenant with Noah and with all flesh in him throughout their generations, which means everyone everywhere in the whole world. God has made a covenant with mankind through Noah. And one of his commands to us, to everyone, this law applies to you and to your neighbor. Go to the opposite part of the globe this way, applies to them. Go to that. Up here on the globe, it applies to them. Down here, everywhere. The whole world. Everywhere the rainbow shines, it applies. What is that law? To be fruitful and to multiply. 
In the same covenant, God also made a law for all creation that murder is wrong. What is the opposite of being fruitful and multiplying? Killing each other. So these two laws are essentially opposites, but they're mutual opposites. They work together. Be fruitful and multiply. Don't kill each other, which is the opposite of being fruitful and multiplying. Murder is wrong. And these two laws stand as two of the most fundamental truths and laws for all creation. Now, we may think of the prohibition against murder as being in the Ten Commandments. Yes, that's true. The Ten Commandments repeat the prohibition against murder in the Sixth Commandment. And Jesus taught that murder is also an issue of the heart. And so we can expand our understanding of murder in other places in the Scriptures. But God's covenant with Noah is the law and covenant that applies to all peoples, all societies, at all times, and all places. That is the light, that is the foundation, that is the knowledge, that is the truth where we begin. The fundamental truth that man is to be fruitful and multiply, and that murder, the unjust killing of another human, is absolutely forbidden by God. Then we affirm that life, human life, begins at conception. When conception takes place, a God-designed process is initiated that will develop into a specific, complete human person. At conception, you have a complete genetic human person, and all that, that differs from that point until that person's death, whenever it is, is just a matter of development and timeline. They are a complete, individual human being from conception. We should protect all lives all persons, all human beings. We should be fruitful and multiply. Therefore, abortion is unacceptable. It is wrong. And indeed, it is murder. Now, I, I trust that, by and large, I'm preaching to the choir. But the problem is that in our society, abortion, as you well know, is legal permissible, practiced, praised, promoted, and protected. For many in our nation, it is regarded as health care and a right. Now, rights are natural, natural privileges. Inalienable is the word that's often used, meaning it can't be taken away from you. So some think that the world is arranged in such a way that by nature, Women have a right or privilege to kill their own children. This is a denial of reality, a perversion of God's creation, a suppression of the light of God's law, and the exchange of the truth for a lie. And so we have to recognize this is the empire that we live in. These are the laws of the land where we live, and we must not live according to the laws of our land in this point. We must live according to God's will and do that which is good, acceptable, and perfect in his eyes. And if we are intolerated as a result, then so be it. We fear God, not man. I want to note something here, and that is that the truth about this and the stance that we take or the position that we are asserting here is not, quote-unquote, Christian at all. What do I mean by that? God's command to multiply, as well as his prohibition on murder, are given to us in a common covenant that applies just as much to your neighbor as to you. So to insist on an anti-abortion stance is not even a Christian thing to do exclusively. It's something that everyone should do. The civil magistrate should be outlawing abortion. Voters should be voting against abortion. Don't, here's, the, here's the error. The Noahic Covenant is recorded in the Bible, so people think it's just a church thing. God revealed it to Noah and to all flesh. It's just recorded in the Bible, but it's for everyone and applies to everyone. So don't think that this is a Christian issue exclusively. It's just that the, the church teaches through the Bible, and so the church declares what has been recorded in the scriptures. But this is a common kingdom issue. The Noahic covenant is recorded in the scriptures, but it applies to all. And actions taken against abortion belong properly to the civil sphere 
of citizens and magistrates. It's a mistake to think that only Christians should have this stance or that only Christians ought to live according to these laws as revealed to to Noah from God. No, it is for all mankind. It is his will for the world, not just the church. And if you think, well, is it really going to be a big issue? It it already is. It's a huge issue. And right now, in a rare moment of of commending, uh, commending bishops, there are Roman Catholic bishops who are denying the sacrament of the Eucharist, that is what we would call the Lord's Supper, they're denying it to lawmakers or to high-ranking officials who are pro-abortion. And so these lawmakers are accusing the Roman Catholic Church of weaponizing the sacrament in favor of a pro-life stance. And here we say, yes, you should not give the grace of Christ in the sacrament to those who promote and legalize murder. So what I'm trying to say is it's an issue that is being debated, active, that we cannot just turn a blind eye to. We must be prepared to oppose this as citizens, and then our gospel conversion only reinforces all of these truths. Another thing to add here is that we also should acknowledge that there are rare, extremely rare cases where a situation arises in which the only possible way to save a mother's life is by performing an operation that will end the baby's life. However, we need to make careful distinctions. In such operations, the purpose is not to end the baby's life. The purpose is to save the mother's life. And the only means to do so unavoidably is to end the baby's life as an unavoidable consequence. And so from that perspective, it it really shouldn't even be called abortion because abortion's purpose is to end the baby's life. The purpose of such a procedure is not to end the baby's life. And so therefore, this is not murder. Murder is unjust killing. This is not unjust. There are rare cases where one life must be sacrificed to save another and difficult but real choices have to be made in those situations. So we do not, by, by forbidding abortion, by condemning it, we are not condemning uh, a situation such as this where an extremely difficult decision might have to be made in those cases. But if we define our terms, I would hesitate to call that uh, an abortion because you're fixing a different problem that will unavoidably cause the baby to die. You're not going in there to kill the baby. Much more could be said about this, but we need to stop there. Secondly, the second law of this land by which we ought not to live, second is divorce. God commands man to be fruitful and to multiply. In what context does Reproduction, multiplication, fruitfulness. In what context does that take place? Well, before God gave to Adam and Eve the command to be fruitful and multiply, he brought them together in marriage. God brought together the man and the woman, and he instituted marriage for them, and then he gave them the command to be fruitful and to multiply. A man and woman leave their parents, they become one flesh, and what God has united in marriage, no one should separate. What separates them? divorce does, at least finally and officially. There's many other things that have separated them previously. Now, the subject of divorce is greatly debated. It's also one that's actually not addressed in our confession of faith. So there are various views on it, even among those who attended our church, and we do not have an official stance on divorce in every point of it. We don't have an exhaustive stance. And the scriptures do make allowance for divorce in certain cases, but we're not going to start with the problem and try to work back to a solution. Whatever exceptions or cases may legitimize a divorce, that's not our concern. Our concern is that our culture and our laws make divorce a more or less on-demand commodity. You want it? You got it. In our society, the door to leave your marriage is always open. Every day, it's open. You want to leave? You can leave. And our society walks out that door with frightening regularity and nonchalance. I don't like this anymore. 
I've fallen out of love. I'm out. As Christians, we must refuse to live according to the customs and laws of this empire in which we walk as exiles. We must insist on repentance. We must insist on forgiveness. We must insist on grace and mercy and faithfulness and service. And we ought to embody love that suffers long and love that covers a multitude of sins and love that is quick to confess, quick to repent, quick to admit, quick to humbly acknowledge. But again, this is not a quote-unquote Christian issue. Many continue to live with the idea that the church oversees marriage. That's not true. The church must solemnize your union. That's not true. If that's true, then only the church could dissolve your union. If only the church could grant marriages, then only the church could grant divorce. Oh, it's the Middle Ages again. No, neither of those are true. You don't need a minister to get married. You don't need a minister to get divorced. This is a common kingdom issue. As Christians, though, we know that the husband and wife are a picture of Christ and the church, and we know that the fruit of the Spirit ought to fuel a true love in marriage. All of these things, the fact that God has commanded us, God has called us to multiply and be fruitful. God has brought man and woman together in marriage. God has said, do not separate them. All of these things mean that divorce ought to be a rare last resort for irreconcilable situations or for protection in cases of abuse. And by irreconcilable, I don't mean, well, they just can't get along. I mean, he or she has abandoned me and will not come back. Or a last resort of protection in abusive situations. Pause here and remember, if we are known for being faithful spouses who have and love children, if that is what we ought to be as first citizens of the common kingdom, and then as Christians, faithful husbands and wives with families, if that's what God has called us to be, believer or unbeliever, but reinforced as believers, what kind of sick society wants to remove toleration for us? No, don't tolerate those people that want to stay married and have children and families. We don't like them. They are, they are a cancer to society. You see, when you know the light and the truth, when you have knowledge of what God has commanded, you spot the errors, you discern the problems much more clearly. You see just how sick and sinful our society is. And we already know they're sinful. But I'm talking about how these things are enshrined in law. It is the laws of this land that promote things like abortion. And the laws of this land that promote things like divorce. And the fact that we may acknowledge rare exceptions where a baby's life must be ended for something that looks like abortion but isn't. And though we may acknowledge rare exceptions where divorce is, is a necessary or unavoidable, irreconcilable situation... That doesn't change the fact that our society revels in these things. And the, the way in which divorce and abortion are practiced and promoted, protected and praised is, is sickening and it is wrong. And we must not live by the laws of our land, even if the world says, you're so different, you're so backwards, you're so bigoted, you're so hateful, you're so ancient, you're so fundamental, you're so whatever terms they want to use. We say, we fear God, not man. And you're, we don't say this, but I might think it. And you're insane if you think that faithful spouses and fruitful families are bad for society. Well, because we don't have time, this is where in Spanish ministry I said, oh, we don't have time for the third thing. But I do want to skip the third thing and move to briefly some of the conclusions that I had prepared. So three conclusions.
First, you must know what God has said. This is just repeating the the fundamentals. You have to have the knowledge of these truths in order to discern errors. You have to take away the positive teaching from this sermon and from God's teaching in, in other in books and other sermons and such things. You need to not just hear and leave, you, you need to receive this teaching and believe it as God has commanded, be fruitful and multiply. God has commanded, the one who sheds man's blood is to have his, his blood shed by man. God has commanded these things. You must know what is good, what is pleasing, and what is perfect according to God's will. If you do, you will discern, and you will not be conformed to the wicked and rebellious laws of this land. You will see them for what they are. We also have to help our children see them. We need this clear knowledge so that we can teach it to our children because they are more and more being indoctrinated at all levels in all places with wicked ideas such as these. And some of the children's literature that has been produced in recent decades deals with things like this and teaches the most horrible things in the most apparently innocent way. It's despicable and it's wrong. And they will not come to that with discernment. That will form their level one fundamental knowledge if we do not give them level one fundamental knowledge. If we do not impart to them at the right time and at the right place and at the right age, knowledge about these things, someone else will. And this is not just a Christian issue. These two issues that we have highlighted are true for the common kingdom as well as the kingdom of Christ, which is the church. They are going to be put under immense pressure, and we have to prepare them to see through the smoke screens and listen past the shouting and the yelling that will be sent their way. Second, We must avoid controversy, love our neighbor, and obey God. We must avoid controversy, love our neighbor, and obey God. Again, let us be known for our vice. Oh, no. Let us be known for our virtue. And if they choose to call our virtue vice, so be it. Let us be known for our holiness. And if they call our holiness foolishness, that's a dumb way to live, so what? Let us be known for our love. And if they call our love hate, so be it. If the empire around us chooses that we are not worth tolerating, because we don't live according to their laws of abortion and divorce and so much more, if they want to burn down the family and society and culture, they're going to do it. If they want to poison themselves, cut off their own feet, and destroy everything that society stands on and should be built up by, namely families, so be it. As Christians and as citizens, we must live out these truths no matter what, tolerated or not tolerated. Thirdly and lastly, we have wonderful good news for a sick and sinful world. We have wonderful good news for a sick and sinful world. You see, the fact that abortion and divorce are common kingdom issues may make it seem like, well... (laughs) Is this a Christian sermon then? And it's drawn from God's teaching in his word, so yes, it absolutely is. But Christianity reinforces our duties as citizens, reinforces our duties in the common kingdom. But what we do have to offer the world, what we possess and can offer to the world that is truly Christian, that is uniquely and exclusively Christian, is Christ. So that we say to the murderesses of this world, and we say to the divorcees of this world, we say God's grace is so abundant. God's mercy is so free. God's salvation in Jesus Christ is so powerful 
that it can and it will forgive and cleanse murderesses and divorcees and all sinners in all the world. That is what we have to offer the world, is wonderful good news that Jesus Christ took on our flesh and lived a holy life so that when he died on the cross, he offered himself as a pure and perfect sacrifice for sin and suffered God's wrath against sinners. And those who trust in him, those who acknowledge, I am wicked and I am sinful, and this is the extent of my misery and the extent of my sinfulness, how can I be saved from this great burden of sin? We say to them, that's what the church offers a sick and dying world. That is what we have for you. That is what is Christian. Good news of forgiveness, the gospel, that all those who trust in that dead and resurrected Messiah, Jesus Christ, their sins are forgiven them. And his perfect life is given to them. And they are therefore saved from their sins. There's no condemnation for them. We're going to come back to this next week, Lord willing, because one of the concepts that we need to think clearly about is shame. The scriptures have things to say about shame on the one hand. Our culture has things to say about shame on the other hand. What is truly shameful? Is shame good or bad? And how is shame removed? You see, the gospel has answers to these questions, which we'll come back to. The gospel removes the stain of sin. The gospel removes the guilt of sin. The gospel frees us from our wickedness. It's like Pilgrim's Progress. He belongs, Pilgrim belongs to the city of destruction. It's going to be destroyed for its wickedness. But he says, I'm going to the celestial city. I'm going to a place of light and life everlasting because I trust in Jesus Christ. And that is what we have to offer and must be faithful in proclaiming to the world week in and week out, as well as living in our lives and showing to our children and teaching them. We teach them not just the law. We teach them the gospel. And if the world hates us for keeping God's law, so be it. If they hate us for proclaiming God's gospel, so be it. We are blessed when we suffer for Christ's sake and in his name. And that's enough. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for your grace and mercy once again. That you save sinners of all kinds. That your grace and your mercy wipe us clean. We pray that you would help us to know your truth, to discern error, to live according to your law, and to cling to your gospel for hope and for forgiveness. We pray, O oh Lord our God, that you would convict the hearts of sinners here today, that they might turn from their wickedness, not just to be good citizens in this world, but that they might turn from their wickedness to Jesus Christ and find salvation in him. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name.